Oh my god, this thumbnail. I have to hold these books up, don't I? <sighs> hey guys, I've been teasing about this video for months. It's my no spoilers take on three related fantasy trilogies by Robin Hobb, which are the Farseer trilogy, the Live Ship Traders trilogy, and hang on, <laughs> I haven't coordinated this well, the Tawny Man trilogy. So there's a quartet and another trilogy in this same series, but I have plenty to discuss with these three. I'm gonna take you through how I spaced them out, then go through each trilogy and give you a sort of reading diary with overall strengths and weaknesses, and round things out by giving advice about the order to read them in. So let's do this. Two of the things that scare people about approaching these books are their quantity and girth. They're giants, most of them. I'd never arranged them together before preparing this video, and stacking them all up on top of one another, like, it's ludicrous. It's so much. So there's this understandable fear that to experience this series it has to consume your reading. And that's just not the case. I read the first of these back in November of 2016, and sometimes waited up to five months each time until I picked up the next book. Because remember, these were originally written with the thought that people would have to wait a year or more for the next installment each time. So it's really easy to jump back into these worlds after a break. And I personally preferred reading them that way because even though I love Robin Hobb's writing, after 600 to 900 pages of it in one go, I was craving something else. And that meant that when I did pick up the next book, it was because I was specifically in the mood for Robin Hobb. So reading the series doesn't have to be this barricade between you and all other books. I read dozens of books in and amongst all of these, and so it felt like coming back to an old friend each time I picked back up with the storyline. Now some of you will say, I could never do that once I start a series, I have to know what happens. Well then you could go about things the way that my brother is. So he read the Farseer books in the space of two weeks. He was obsessed, actually. <laughs> um, one night a lady friend invited him over and he lied and said he was busy because he wanted to keep reading and I have never been prouder. Anyway. After the Farseer trilogy, he took a break, waited a few months, and he's only now getting into the live ship books. So even if you're someone who you know needs to know what happens next, you can space the trilogies out. They each have distinct storylines. In the Farseer books, we follow a boy named Fitz from the time he's around six to his early 20s. He's the bastard son of the king-in-waiting, whose wife is barren. And when this man, chivalry Farseer, learns about his bastard son, he abdicates in disgrace and leaves the throne to his next oldest brother. So chivalry goes off to live out his days in ignominy. But meanwhile, Fitz is raised at the castle. This is set in a stereotypical medieval fantasy world. And so it's about Fitz growing into his role as a member of the royal family who can never be fully acknowledged or treated as a member of that family. And it's about war and court politics shenanigans involving his younger uncle who sees Fitz as a threat to his potential throne. I started Assassin's Apprentice months before actually reading it because I was craving fantasy and had heard such great things about this series. I couldn't get past the first chapter. I was like, oh my god, this is slow. The Farseer trilogy is told from Fitz's first person perspective and he's quite a thorough scribe, so I put it down. But then in November of 2016, for whatever reason, I felt the need to escape from this world. So I tried again and it picks up around the 80 page mark and actually turns into a fairly pacey and really entertaining read at just under 400 pages, which is the main reason it's the strongest in this first series. Next up was Royal Assassin, still entertaining, but 650 pages. And there's a big chunk of the middle where Fitz summarizes his activities over a period of time and then he summarizes them again and again. But the ending is like, like things get real. So yeah, it could have been cut by around 100 pages, but still pretty good. Then we get to this monstrosity, Assassin's Quest, 830 pages. And it's just a bad book, I think, because of how poorly edited it is. And this isn't just casting aspersions on Hobbes editor. Like she should have been able to self edit better than this. Compare it to, the first book in the trilogy. This easily could have been this size. There are huge swaths where nothing happens. Now one thing Hobb does in both of Fitz's series is to really ground you in the physical realities of his experiences. So part of her strategy, especially in Assassin's Quest, is to record 
mundane but important things like how little opportunity he has to sleep and bathe and eat so that when he finally sleeps, for example, it's notable and, and you feel how tired he must be. But she could have made that point with half the pages and after slogging through this puppy, like the ending is so rushed. It's, it's just crazy how poorly paced it all is. I also think the main villain of this series, the uncle character, is quite weak. His motivations remain surface level and there are passages in this book that are supposed to impart revelations about him, but they're all things that you deduced at the beginning of the first book, so that's a disappointment. At this point, you might be asking, why read these? You know, beyond being able to continue to the other trilogies, which are much better. Fitz is a fantastic character. I feel very strongly about him. When I hear or see someone be like, ugh, Fitz is stupid, I'm like, I can't talk to you about this. You know, we can disagree, but he's fantastic and I will die on this hill. Another thing I love about all of these books, but especially the Farseer trilogy, is that the side characters feel like they exist independent of the protagonist. I used to occasionally skim YA fantasy series and almost always they felt like movie sets, like all the other rooms were dark and were waiting for the main character to enter for them to light up. This isn't like that at all. There's such a strong sense that all of these people are individuals and that they're off doing their own things no matter how much or how little contact Fitz has with them. So my favorite character is a minor one, Patience, Chivalry's wife. Her scenes with Fitz are wonderful and you just feel that she could have her own trilogy. There are two main magic systems in this world, one related to communing with animals and the other involving mind control of humans, you know, to simplify a lot. Both are pretty stereotypical in theory and they have stereotypical elements, but as the books go along, Hob fleshes them out so much, you know, to the point where they don't feel lazy because she gives them these extensive, complicated histories that the characters themselves are only hazily aware of and she creates real consequences for these systems. So it's never like, Magic, like we, nah. I'll have some more comments on that first series when I get to the third trilogy, but for now, let's move on to The Last Ship Traders. <laughs> yeah, I am like, feel like I'm bench pressing here because each of these are around 900 pages. So they could seem intimidating and they are like hurting my wrist holding them like this, but these fly like way more so than all the other books. They're set in the same general world as Fitz's, but in a different region that's far south of where he lives, so there's very little overlap. This trilogy is in third person from many different perspectives. The majority of these characters live in a port town. They're sailors and merchants and pirates. Some families in this port town have magical ships with figureheads that seem alive, and one of these port families, the Vestrits, faces major turmoil at the beginning of the first book. In my favorite books of 2017 video, I mentioned the third installment as my favorite in this series, but you know, with more distance, I actually think it's Ship of Magic. It's fairly easy to create momentum in a final book in a series when you're reading desperately to find out what's gonna happen to everybody, but Hob creates that same momentum in this book, which is almost entirely exposition, the first 30 pages took some getting into, but from the second chapter on, like, it hits the ground running. I read through this furiously. Then we have the Mad Ship, also amazing, but it slows down a little at the very end in some crucial moments. In general, I think Hob is much stronger at conversations and internal reflections than she is in action-packed moments. Her writing's just too detailed to maintain excitement all that well, although, you know, to be fair, she does handle those types of scenes well throughout this series. And then Ship of Destiny was baller. I was like, how is she gonna resolve all of these problems in 900 pages? At the beginning, there's so much going on and she's continually introducing conflicts up to the first half of this book anyway, but then she just ties that all together and it's awesome. So as you can tell, I have far fewer qualms about this series. It's just much more original and invigorating than the first, more tightly plotted, the politics are more complicated, and the characters are phenomenal. I remember all of them so clearly. They're of all different ages, and Hob is equally good at drawing male and female characters. I have two favorites in here, one's a man, one's a woman, and because there's so much more traveling in this series, so much of it being at sea, the characters experience different cultures, and you see how each of these cultures has different gendered expectations. So especially for the women, but for the men as well, they have to adapt their dress 
and mannerisms and how much attention they draw to themselves based on where they happen to be geographically in this world. A minor weakness for me is that there's a major character arc that everybody else loves but I thought was a bit rushed and I love where this character starts and ends up but the transition wasn't totally convincing and I wish it had been because the arc itself is so cool. Then there's another character who I never found as interesting as the others. They seemed less multi-dimensional and the series is so clever with how it manages this because I was justified in thinking that. That's all I'll say about it. I admire how gracefully these books handle difficult issues. The system of slavery in this world is entirely different from ours but thought-provoking in its own way. And then in the third book there's something horrible that happens to a major character. If you've read these you'll probably know which horrible thing I'm referring to. And I just appreciated how Hob dealt with this storyline. You know, when her characters experience trauma, it's never for the sake of shock value and Hob never loses sight of the long-term implications of these traumas. Last thing to talk about for this series is how some aspects of the overarching magical world are gradually revealed and raise large ethical questions about memory and about the consequences of humans treating the world like it's entirely theirs to control. And Hob is quite subtle with this because she shows that some of the consequences of these human choices are negative, but some are positive. You know, real good can come out of bad and that's not insignificant. And yet the positives still don't outweigh the negatives, probably. I'm being really vague, I know, but what I'm trying to say is that the ethical concerns in this trilogy are presented in a very interesting manner. Okay, on to the last series, the Tawny Man trilogy, my favorite of the three. The live ship books are better, but these own my heart. We return to Fitz's story and his first person perspective when he's 35, still recovering from the traumas of the first trilogy. He's been through a lot. And at first it was a shock to my system to transition back to Fitz's voice. It's just so much more ponderous in tone than the live ship books, but in that way it, it also felt like coming home. Fool's Errand was the slowest. You spend a good chunk of the opening getting caught up with everything, which I didn't mind, but it means the story takes a while to get going. This one is around 580 pages, so after the live ship books I was like, where's the other half? Then The Golden Fool was my favorite of these three because it takes you back to the castle setting and I loved seeing older Fitz in his old haunts and this one is around 630 pages so like the first trilogy they get progressively longer as you go along because Fool's Fate is 800 pages but this one actually justifies its length. Probably the best of these three. It introduces a new setting and it's pretty slow for the first half before getting intense in the second. First of all, there's a connection between the live ship and Farseer trilogies that I didn't get until I started Tawny Man and then I was like, snaps girl. I mean, I wish I could talk about the spoiler. I won't, but it's an interesting bit of social commentary. But the reason that I love these books so much is their deep, delicate, emotional tenor. The way that all the conversations and interactions are loaded with memories and personal vulnerabilities that can't be spoken. Fitz really has grown up since the first trilogy. He's much more tired and cautious and in this one he has interactions with younger characters, some of whom are boys his age from the first trilogy, which places the Tharsir books in an entirely new light because you see how impulsive and short-sighted these young characters are and how egocentric. Like, Sometimes they imply to Fitz, oh, you couldn't understand what I'm going through. And as the reader, you want to slap him around the head and be like, you have no idea what he's been through, you little shit, so you can take a seat. But that's what Fitz was like in the first trilogy. I mean, he was pretty emotionally intelligent for a teenage boy, but he thought he was the center of the world's woe and that it was his job to solve things so that when he inadvertently interfered with the plans of older characters, they were like, what are you doing? And in this third trilogy, the glove has been turned inside out. I felt perpetually on the edge of tears reading these books. There are these quiet scenes scattered throughout that hit me really hard. There's one where Fitz dresses up for a social occasion and looks in the mirror and suddenly thinks, I look like my father, which conjures up all the loss both of those men have faced and how Fitz was the cause of so much of that loss for his father but has since paid 
dearly for the choices his father made afterwards and they never had a relationship and it's hard to explain but Hob doesn't have to make a big deal of things because she's already laid the groundwork for you to understand the significance of small moments. A major character I haven't even mentioned yet is The Fool, who's an important side character in the first trilogy. When my brother was reading the first book, he texted me and was like, oh, The Fool is clearly the best character. I didn't pay him that much attention in that first series, but as you can tell from uh, the titles of these, he's kind of a big deal, and good lord, he is awesome, and his scenes with Fitz are the greatest in any of these books. There's a scene in The Golden Fool that is that, like, it's so good. Last comment on this because I'm aware that this is gonna be the longest video I've ever done on this channel. Sorry, not sorry. For the first chunk of Fool's Fade, I was lulled into a sense of complacency and slight frustration because I was like, okay, not much is happening, let's get a move on. And then around the halfway point, I was bowled over because I suddenly realized what Hob had been establishing in all of these unassuming interactions. She's starkly showing you what it means for you to have experienced this story only in the head of one character, and that it's a gift to fully understand one person, but that it distorts your perceptions as a reader so much. Throughout this trilogy, but especially in the third book, Fitz is confronted about choices he's made, and you've witnessed his entire thought process for each one and know exactly where he's coming from. But the other characters are as embedded in their own perspectives as Fitz is in his. And even though he's a really thoughtful man, first person is a wall that's hard to see over no matter who you are. So throughout, Hob nudges the reader by reminding you that even though Fitz has made sacrifices, and his choices didn't come from a place that was remotely selfish, it doesn't mean those choices were the correct ones for others, and those people have a right to be angry. You know, even as the reader naturally will feel defensive on Fitz's behalf, those other characters have a right to their first-person experiences of the world. I'm making it all sound basic. It's not. It's handled beautifully. So, reading order. I do suggest going chronologically Farseer, Live Ship, Tawny Man, because there are many spoilers for the first trilogy and the second, and then Tawny Man goes on both previous trilogies. And I recommend this traditional reading order also because it's nice to get a break from Fitz's voice, you know, to get this third-person breather that's great in itself, but then provides a contrast that will make you notice the particularities of Fitz's voice a lot more. The major issue in this suggestion is I think the Farseer books are by far the weakest of the bunch, and it's asking a lot of people to wade through hundreds of pages, and Assassin's Quest especially, to get to the other books. So if you only want to read one series, or if you think you'll need an overwhelmingly positive experience to want to continue, then you can start with the live ship books and it's not that big a deal. The little mentions of things related to the Farseer books are rare, and you could easily go back and read that trilogy without having your experience change that much by knowing what happens in the seconds, because they really are separate for the most part. And if you're just interested in Fitz's story, you could skip Live Ship and go right from Farseer to Tawny Man. That's not a problem at all, as long as you don't care about Live Ship spoilers. Wrapping this up, I know I've gone on and on, rather in the spirit of Robin Hub, but I love these books, they have their rough patches for sure, but they mean a lot to me and I can't wait to continue with the rest of the series. So please, no spoilers in the comments for the remaining quartet and trilogy in the realm of the Elderlings. And if you're gonna write a spoilery comment about any of these three trilogies, please just mark it as such to warn other people who might not have read them yet. Yes, that's everything, all right. Uh, let me know your thoughts, and thanks for watching, you guys. Assassin's Quest, you are not gonna fuck this up for me. I must have a thumbnail in there. Oh, God! Ah. You guys will never see how much I just whine about this. Wait, how am I supposed to get them off my lap now? Oh my God.